And I think most people here will probably know the, the big ship story, and I'll, I'll go into it a little bit through through the presentation. But um, you know, our, our role in that was to create a more efficient landside network, uh, so that the bigger ship network could be could operate basically. And you know, we go about it. Um, I guess there are three major strategies. We're, we're building freight hubs um, around the country, uh, and we're we're running we're running warehousing and we're running transport of our own. Uh, predominantly in the, in the container, uh, the container movement space, and then we run a run a port gal business, which which is really a freight coordination uh, business, which we really work with lots of different customers, and we bring them together and try and uh, create an efficient supply chain. And I guess our our, our premise is we're trying to take waste out of the supply chain, um, and and therefore low, lower the cost and, and create the efficiencies, and to support that big ship strategy that I talked about. And I guess one of the reasons we, we can do it uh, and, and take the direction we're taking is we do we do bring scale, um, you know, to our network. Uh, we move about um, six and a half million tons, and when you look at the Fonterra network, which is which is our largest customer, you know, there's about thirty percent of New Zealand's export TU you know, go through our go through our system. Uh, you know, over 250,000 uh, TEU, which is 20 foot equivalent containers, and about 90,000 or even close to 100,000 important um, containers as well. So, um, and when you think about a few other um, a, a few other um, metrics, uh, you know, we move products on the road and on the rail. We're the largest, I think, well, depends who's in the room, but we're about the largest user of rail in New Zealand. Uh, we run about 26 rail services a day. Uh, we run about uh, trucks. We have on an average day between 600 to 1,000 trucks on the road under our control. We own about 100 trucks ourselves. Um, so that's the full field business that actually coordinates other people's trucks. Uh, we run those across about 1,000 laneways between about 100 or so different, different sites, customer sites. Uh, we have six of our own hub locations that we're developing and, and we've got other warehouses around the track. So it's a pretty uh, large network. Um, it doesn't compare to say a, a main freight or a toll, Greenwell Linfox or Peter Baker, they're a lot more complex than us. We're, we're, we're bulk, we're, we're rail to hub, um, so, so simple from <coughs> that perspective, but uh, yeah, logistics is inherently complex. And then when you look at the type of freight we move, it's quite simple, it's bulk, it's containerised, it's palletised, but it's food grade and it's dairy grade, so it once again adds an element. Um, uh, I guess of complexity. Um, so when you sort of think about, uh, I know I'm in an academic institution, the next two slides will try to be a little bit academic on it. Um, 
Ik ben een beetje 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 een hypothesis, if you want to call it that, is you know, working independently, everyone can deliver value, and everyone probably does it pretty well. But by actually working together and thinking differently, you know, we can all make a step change in a, in, in a, around value efficiency and sustainability, and how you measure that can be interesting, but I guess what I'm going to talk through today is um, you know, some examples, uh, some examples of how, how we think we've done that. And just Second thing about me, I am an engineer, and I do like models, and given I'm an engineer, I'm in an academic institute, I thought I'd come up with a model. Uh, and for the academia in the room, um, someone might have thought of this before, but I googled it, and nothing came up, so I'm assuming it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, but I'm sure I'll find out later whether this actually is something. But once again, I, I, you know, we, don't, we don't work on these models, but I did try and think, Coming into this game, well, actually, what is what is a model that you know that we sort of all of this fits in? And um, yeah, you, know, you start at the left hand side, and it all has to start with a problem. And generally, it's got to be a problem that's bigger than any one person alone. And more often than not, that can be a customer-driven problem that, that multiple people are trying to solve. And at that point, you you, know, you have got multiple people trying to solve these problems, and a lot of them will have a line strategies as to what they're trying to achieve. It's about finding those people. Um, there's an element of cultural alignment um, that you kind of need to have to be working with these people. And there's, an, there's a requirement to be able to see the value and share the value. Uh, and actually, it leads me to a, um, a little antidote, an anecdote in a way, which is, you know, The two, the two things that really you, you need when it comes to collaboration is firstly is the ability to see the value and share the value. Uh, and the second one is what we call, and I didn't coin this per se, but the no, the no dickhead rule. Um, because actually if you're going to collaborate with someone, it's never going to be easy. No matter how much this model tells you it's going to work, it, it never quite as easy as you think. So you kind of need to, you know, you don't, you don't want to be working with dickheads. Simple as that. And, The concept is you, know, you want to be able to invite them to your family barbecue, and it's actually the barbecue and Dickie's rule. Um, but, uh, and you need to trust, have a level of trust that when things go wrong, you can work through it. But like family, perhaps. The other thing that this has is the big circle around the outside is, has two things in that. One is you sort of need some scale. If you're really going to make a change and collaborate to the degree where you have to solve some of the big customer problems, You need scale and you need a motivated orchestra, uh, orchestrator. I mean, that does say orchestrator. You kind of need someone to take the lead. If you think that you're going to well, come by around the fire uh, and it's going to work out, you, you know, generally won't. You need someone that probably the person with the scale who can then play that, play that lead role. And if you get all those working in a, in a, in a, um, correctly, you, know, you, you can make a step change. Um, it goes back back to the. I, I guess I'll spend a couple of slides going now, reverting to what we do and, and sort of the problem that we that we were facing. And it's it's not just about Coda or uh, you know it does stem from Frontera, but it's really a New Zealand problem. And uh, you know it start it starts with the customer, and particularly getting our products on shelves uh, in Asia, and recognizing that um, you know customers are getting more demand in terms of cost service, um, quality, particularly uh, you know, when it comes to, comes to food, you know, food products. And I'll make decisions looking at, looking at the products based on, you know, the, um, um, uh, well, you know, you know the, the use by date. Whether it's been used by or not, they'll choose the one that, that is the newest. That's, that's their mentality. So, you know, you're competing against large global players that can get onto shelves a lot quicker than we can. So really, the, the, I guess the, the, the point from that leads to that actually as a country, we need to be competing against 
the rest of the world are not against ourselves, not against our, you know, not competitors here. We, we need to be competing against the rest of the world. How do we work together to make that a reality? And then you look at um, you know, the challenges that I know many in the room uh, are once again more, more adverse to than me. It's, you know, we are a long way from the world. We're so reliant on ocean freight. Uh, the old adage is that we're more reliant on them than they are on us. Uh, you know, if it's not efficient to come down to New Zealand, they might just, just not bother coming. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that may not happen, but uh, you can lay on top of that the big ship strategy that I talked about before. Suddenly, we need to change what we're doing if we're going to accommodate the bigger ships that are here today. Um, and, uh, yeah, we need to prepare for them. We need the ports to be uh, dredged, bigger cranes, etc., uh, etc. Uh, that we've seen. For that, there's investment required. Um, investment requires business cases, it requires you know, someone to pay, and it requires you know, cargo to, to make sure that investment can pay off. Um, and then it actually, uh, you know, the other point is that that particular ship there is actually very efficient. And I think they, you know, I'm not, not sure of the size relative, but you know, 26 to 30 percent more efficient than, than some smaller vessels, but only if it's full. And once again, you think about the dynamics of New Zealand and the, the fact we've got 10, I think, container ports or 11, I'm not sure. Um, you know, old days, a smaller ship would be able to bounce around all the ports and fill itself up because products are all these different ports. And it, it worked at a certain time that it took. The bigger ship can't get to all those other ports. So that ship comes in here, it can only go to one or two, maybe three ports. It's all that freight. That has to get on that ship that's not, not actually at that particular port. You know, we've got a, we've got, we've now got a challenge to fill that particular ship, and that requires us to think completely differently about how the land side supply chain works. How do you consolidate freight close to the big ship port so that when that ship comes in, it, you can very quickly uh, offload it online. And I guess you know once again, you know, the theory is that um, you know these ships don't want to hang around for much longer than a small ship. So suddenly you've got to be, you know, so, so a simple customer problem has turned into quite a large logistics problem here in New Zealand. So once again, it all comes back to investment, thinking about a, 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 a different network and then how do you make that happen. And of course, you look at our, our New Zealand land side network um, and where, you know, the story I just told is just about how we need to change it. And that requires investment in building hubs and it requires better use of rail and, you know, interchanges into modal capability. What we do know about the New Zealand network, it is an, it's inherently inefficient. Um, rail, uh, depending on where you look, is in the order of 30% utilised, 70% underutilised. Again, depends who you talk to. You know, trucks anywhere between sort of 60 to maybe 90% utilised if they're really going well, but they, you know, we have got lots of space in our network. So I guess the, the point is how do we look at our landslide network and take waste out of our landslide network first, create value out of that before we start looking to, to invest too much further. And I guess we need to think differently because, you know, it's not just the old way of scale, which is what I talked about before, having a means you've got a big step. Because the old, you know, strong competition at every stage of the supply chain, it's there today, yet we still have an efficiency. So the old way doesn't work. From a procurement perspective, the standard, how do I beat my suppliers up to, to create a different way of working or to try and create value out of the supply chain, doesn't work. So we need to think differently. And what's missing? Now we've got the demand, we've got the services, we've got people that do stuff, we've got people that build stuff, so what's different? We don't. Collaboration, we're not, we're not talking. All of these things are, are, are working independently. Trying to solve problems independently. Their own problems, and they're probably quite good at it. But when you start to look at that big problem that I've just sort of taken, taken you through, people working independently can't solve it. Then you start to look about, you know, um, how you think differently, uh, you know, how, what, different, what thinking differently means from a commercial perspective as well. And, and, I, and if you think about, uh, and Noel, you'll be familiar with, you know, this is essentially a, pretty simply a Fonterra supply chain, uh, or any, any supply chain, and, and the, the way of thinking is to do it sequentially from the start of the supply chain 
through to the end of the supply chain. You know, you work out how your warehouse can be efficient and you run it really, really well and you've got working hours, you've got labour losses, etc. because that's the way to make a warehouse efficient. You then ring the trucking company and tell them, in this case, but imagine that's a truck, uh, you've already worked out you're going to go to the nearest port because surely you know the, the lowest transport cost is to get to the nearest port and you ring the truck and you tell them what time they need to be there because you've worked out based on your really efficient warehouse uh, what time your pallet is going to be um, presented on the port port. Uh, it's all good, supply chain 101, fantastic, and your truck then goes to the nearest port because you've got the lowest landslide transport and, and you know what, there's only one vessel there and you've, you've negotiated the hell out of that, you've got the best rate. Maybe there's two vessels. And that actually was the exact scenario for um, product in the Low and Wood Island of, uh, out of Whairoa, Ontario Milk Town, and they went across to New Plymouth. You know, it was, it was quite a, probably a, quite a nice supply chain. But then you looked at the the relative cost of, of that supply chain and, and worked out that actually out of Port of Tauron at the time uh, there were, versus the, the one or two services at New Plymouth, there were 13 out of the Port of Tauron. And they were quicker services to get to where you needed to get to in China. And so you started to think, well actually maybe I'll optimise this first. Maybe that's the way to why, why, why am I dictated to by what's happening over here, which is that sequential? And you start to, and then, and then you, okay, we can use rail. Um, and you, you start to think about the supply chain differently. Now, your ocean freight's come down, and these are, this is obviously theoretical numbers. Your land transport's arguably gone up. You're moving product further probably a lower unit cost per kilometre rail versus road, but, and, you, and your warehousing may have gone up as well, because to meet your rail schedule now, you might need to extend the hours of your warehouse or change the way the warehouse works, or even modify some components of the warehouse. So you, see, you can see you're investing in a supply chain, but your prize is captured because you are able to see the end-to-end -end supply chain and start to think differently about how, not just about how product flows, but how, how the value is, um, um, so you, you turn that into a, um, uh, I guess, a collaboration value model evolution. Once well, again, I'm not very theoretical, so hopefully this kind of makes sense. Yeah, and what I've just talked about is, you know, you, you've done a probably quite a classic, uh, you know, rationalise and thinking to end, and and it sort of works. But it's only, it's only the very start of a collaboration journey in terms of how you actually capture value. In that case I just talked about, you know, you've lowered the end-to-end -end cost, you've actually, you've actually improved your services to, to China in this case, you've got more services, you've rationalised your ports in a way, you, you, you are taking uh, the freight to a, another port where more services are, uh, you've got the best mode, and you've got a pretty damn good supply chain. Um, so you can't argue too much. But then, and, and, and I'll use the Katahi, uh, and the CODA formation model. At this stage, so Fonterra had done <coughs> this particular piece of work, and actually, just to go back a step, people on the Taranaki couldn't understand it. Why would you send your product, what we used to send at 150k, and now you're sending at 500k, they just couldn't get it, because they couldn't see that end-to-end -end value chart. Right? Whereas Fonterra was able to go, well, I've just saved 20% of the and that stacks up to be, makes it worthwhile. They then said, actually, uh, dairy is quite seasonal. So if I can work with, collaborate with other cargo owners now, and I look at apples and I look at um, kiwi fruit, etc., all just containers. So why don't, why don't we collaborate with other cargo owners and we can now start to look at how we can square curve our demand and the first thing we do is we can commercialise some space on, on those vessels and, uh, and, and, and make some money. Um, and that's why Kotahi was created. So Fonterra spun off an organisation called Kotahi about now, I think, now of it. And, and that Kotahi was able to go out and work with other cargo owners and, and square curve um, the demand and, uh, and, 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 and arbitrage the rate in a way 
you know, buy buy a certain rate and then and then um, sell them in the marketplace. Other cargo owners were paying a lower rate, um, and it's you know, the cargo was complementary, uh, created an EBIT stream, and but it also increased leverage, so that Fonterra could then go to the <coughs> carriers, and once again, rather than beat them up for better rates, they go actually, if we if we do this well enough and we smooth our demand and we start to jointly plan about how your assets are operating, uh, we might be able to take a whole ship out of rotation. And so there's one whole ship you don't need to bring down to New Zealand, so what's that worth? And it's sort of another layer of collaboration in a way where, um, I think it's worth $25 million, as I recall, and um, you know, there's a discount, it's still a price discount. It's still, it's still about how your prices now come down and come down and you, you, you've complemented your price that you're paying with, with some EBIT over here and, and you're having really positive discussions with the, with the ocean freight carriers around how you're helping them be more efficient and run their network and, and what does that look like in terms of um, um, a price and discount. So it's working close with the partners to optimise assets and lower risk, lower risk for the ocean carriers. Then you go a step further and you start to say, well, how do I, how do we fundamentally change the cost base of the network? Now, bigger ships come in here because it was going to change anyway. In terms of the big ship strategy and what, what uh, you know, once again, that story I told at the start, what Ontario needed to do to make sure they can accommodate big ships. But how do you, how do you change the cost base and by lower the cost to serve, get a share in that value? And that's taking collaboration to another whole level again. Because suddenly, uh, I mean, and, and to be fair, this is where they, I go back to that, you know, that, that theoretical model about you know, uh, barbecues, etc. cetera. Um, people won't inherently share the value. You kind of, although you might not have a big stick, you need to create the mechanisms and the atmosphere, you know, the, ha having that scale and being that orchestrator helps. So how do you, so, well, okay, okay, Mr. Ocean Bowline, you're going to move to a big ship. We know that's going to um, create efficiencies for you. We've taken a vessel out of rotation. We're, we're smoothing the volume. Um, we're investing in our port to, uh, to make sure that we can accommodate your ship. You're going to save a lot of money. How do we get rid of that? So then you start to think about you know, long-term deals, because they need the cargo. So that's when you had Fonterra through Kotahi, join with Merce, join with Port of Talon and go, well, 10-year deal, 10-year deal, stake in the port, we'll give you our volume, you can go and invest, you can create, you've got a 10-year level of certainty around what you need to do. Um, and and, and you, you, you start to get skin in the game. And that's when CODA was formed, because CODA was actually a formation of uh, the landside entities from Ontario, which was DTL, the four kill piece and the landside entities from Port of Tauranga, mm -hmm. who were the uh, TAPA priority and, and um, uh, the box company called Metrobox and Metropac. So they brought the landside entities together and put a management team over them and, and, and run them as a, as a single organisation. So once again, it's, it's taking uh, another whole step of what collaboration means in terms of how you form commercial arrangements so that the value can be shared. So you go back to that model, you're now sharing the value in more unique ways, long-term ways. You're working with people who you would invite to a family barbecue. Uh, you're all strategically aligned. And in the case of the land side, you know, CODA became their orchestrator with the scale behind us at Fonterra to bring all those partners together to make, to make this network operate. So that we can solve, ultimately, the customer problem. We had our own customer problem, maybe, just getting product to port. At, a, at the lowest cost, given we were moving up further. And that's taking an industry-wide view, really, to, to lower network costs, reduce waste, bigger ships, hubs, mode sharing, etc. Make sense? Um, and I guess from that point, I, I, I uh, covered this one a little bit different because, you know, at that point you go, right, so how do I scale it further? And now you're starting to talk about, well, I think anyway, about integrated planning, how you seamlessly connect all the partners, how you take ecosystem thinking, how you basically bring more people into your model and how you can do that seamlessly. 
far beyond what you can do, uh, I guess, through traditional mechanisms. You'll start to look at digital technology, um, growing scale quicker, obviously to create EBIT streams, et cetera, new value opportunities, and things like the, the TNX marketplace that we have invested in is, is, a, is an example of, of that type of thing that I'll, I'll just show a quick screenshot uh, of, of later. So I guess that was um, uh, my attempt in a way to think through what we've actually done in terms of Fonterra consolidating ports, creating Kotahi, smoothing demand, creating you know, big ship capability, forming Koda, uh, and then even investing in TNX. All examples of where we've had to work across the industry, collaborate, think about the commercial models that we could put in place to, so that people would actually work together and construct it. Any questions at that point? It's kind of a natural break before I go into a bit of a death by PowerPoint example. <laughs> Quick question, Scott. When you're, when you're inviting people to your family barbecue okay. at the outset of this exercise, have you already selected who you're going to invite and know they're not dickheads using your terminology? Huh. Or have you um, picked them because of their volumes and their likely synergies? And you find out later they're dickheads or whatever. Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, well, no, I think I think I think the, there's, there's a bit of both. So you, I mean, if you look at um, the 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 latter is where you've got to start. You know, that strategy piece really is where you need um, to start. Um, and I, I, I probably shouldn't answer the second piece of what, of what you find out about people later, but you, you know you do need to assess that. It's like any any sort of selection process, I guess, because you know you, you have to be structured about it, uh, and you do need to assess a number of factors, and one of those is the cultural fit. But you know that 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 can be found out just by a willingness to come to the table. Um, it's actually my, my dicky thing is a little bit facetious in a way because you. Even if you don't quite like them, you kind of need to trust them. It's probably more about that, which is probably more like family, right? Which is the barbecue piece. Yeah, you often go to barbecues and it's like, oh, goodness. Anyway, um, sorry, I won't go into that. So I don't know if I quite answered that, Tom. I didn't, I didn't expect a precise answer. I was just interested by the, you know, the process. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't. I wondered if you did any research on this beforehand, because in the US they do a lot of this um, sharing and co. Co-sharing and reducing well, I did Google costs. it and I, I, look, I, I, I looked down the street, couldn't find anything and moved on. No, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious there as well. Um, I, it's a very, you know, I don't think, and I don't know what other industry players in the room think, but I don't think we're that theoretical about this. Um, we kind of, New Zealand does have some unique challenges. Uh, we just looked to solve the problems we had in front of us. We had to work with the partners we had in front of us, where it would be Q Rail and the ocean carriers and there's only a few ports. Um, I would, maybe we could look, we, we possibly could learn more by going further afield and looking, but I, I personally haven't really done much other than the Google, I did the list to see if that, anyone else had that more. Um, but, and I don't think this is rocket science to be fair. You know, this is just moving trucks to trains to, um, but, but look, this all started, and Noel, you might have even been around in Fonterra when a lot of this started. This started by some smart people coming in and advising. So, but one, even at that point, you know, the big ship strategy was just something that we knew was happening. And so, so you can sort of see the factors that are starting to evolve people's thinking. Um, so I, once again, I'm not sure I've answered that question as well, but I, I, I um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're, you know, which is why I'm interested, I'd be interested to see what other people think from, you know, that's why coming and talking to an organisation like like the University of Auckland and their supply chain program is, is interesting for me because I'd, be, I'd love to know what we're missing. So the question, if I could go back one slide, because I think the story you tell is a great story and it starts at the left hand to be able to get to investment. And in your commentary, if I can ask you, around the New Zealand um, temperature control network, mm. which I think is underinvestment, underinvested, bursting at the seams and in decay because of the age of the assets and the suitability for the modern 
supply chain requirement in New Zealand. So I think it's a New Zealand industry question. To you would be, if I see a problem one, two, three, four blocks along the journey, um, do we start there to solve a collaborative, collaborative problem? Or do we really need to start at the beginning to be able to get to trust, to make the big investment in, in the cool chain? I, I, I think you've got to, you know, the thing about, I mean, the first thing about, we, this is ambient to me, just so, so people that are really aware of, we, we're, sorry, that's a bit unfair. We, we, we run, obviously, chilled containers because the container's a container, but when you start to think about the land side network, particularly uh, the, the model I'm about to show you, the way we've changed the network, it would be difficult to do more difficult to do in a chilled, particularly frozen. Um, so there's an element of, it's quite hard, and as soon as you have got a frozen transport leg you, you, or a chilled one, you need the right infrastructure of either end, etc. Et so it does it does become more tricky. I think there's something about um, yeah, even even just the biggest issues we've got in the is just being able to find complementary cargo from others and then be able to consolidate it. Um, it, it becomes inherently more difficult with with chill we've found. Uh, and an example, for example, is that you can't put frozen chickens on the same, you remember this one? On the same space as frozen butter. Not too sure why, because they're both frozen, but you, you just can't. Um, now there are often things around food grade ambient that you can't do either, but it's a little bit more flexible. You know, there are some things around chill that just become inherently harder. But I think if you can get over how you can scale the land side network, because once it's in a container, it doesn't matter, I and mean, you could start, you know, I don't think that's difficult at all, perhaps. But really unlocking this right the way through the supply chain is every mode needs to be connected, and every mode needs to be able to be uh, um, shared, if you like. And when I say every mode, you have a warehouse, the, the truck, the train, the boat, once it's in a container, it becomes easier. So, yeah, I've um, answered your question, I think it's... I, I think you have. I think you're saying um, the answer to New Zealand's infrastructure challenge in, in the temperature control space is to get scale. And, and I think, back up to your model, which is Tom's question earlier, your opening model around customer problem. Yeah, and then collaboration. What's, inter what's interesting about... Uh, sorry, what's interesting about the chill again is finding that... Uh, that orchestrates is quite hard to, because there are un unlike unlike the ambient market where you've got a lot of small players, and there's space for one large player to come in and, and you know start to create some of this activity. If you look at the chill network, and it is um, there are less players for a start. Um, it's, it's, I think it's a higher barrier to entry. Um, those players are inherently bigger as a result. So you've got a number of quite larger play players. So you know they're probably all fighting amongst themselves as to who could be the best. And you, you and, and then ultimately you need the customer uh, finding a finding a, a large customer that can, I guess, take the lead. And you look at uh, on, I, once again this isn't based on theory, but you look at the chilled market and there's you know there's the supermarkets. Fonterra is not dominant in the chilled, for example. Fonterra was dominant in the ambient food grade, so it gave it, I guess that, I know, it shouldn't be a bit dominant, but they were, their scale was enough that they could start to drive this change. They even don't have that scale in the children network. So you've got all these players that are about the same. Um, and so no, no one of them perhaps is as motivated. And I think this almost comes back to the model of one. I quite like the model, man. It does. I think it works. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you uh, Someone can help me IP it later. Um, but, you know, so, th and that's always the challenge we've had. And the challenge I know we've had is, okay, which cargo owner can we go to and start to have this discussion, knowing that if we have that discussion, we can actually change the market. Everyone you go and talk to, you're sort of, you're, not, you're never big enough to change the market. You almost need to get all the, everyone in, in the one room. But then they've all got different, you know, there's, that, that's that complexity piece, which I think still comes back to here. In this case, Katahi was able to be around containers, be, a, be, be that, uh, have the scale to commercialise. We have been able to do that from a land side, uh, ambient trucking perspective, and even ambient rail perspective.
doing it in a, in a chilled network becomes inherently harder because none of us really have the scale. And like I say, like barbecues, you don't actually need to like them, you just need to respect them, and you need to know that they have got some pulling power and some scale. So, yeah, it's probably a roundabout way to answer that. It's a great, great answer. May I ask you to go back to your model? Because it it's worth me to go back. Yeah, it's worth um, publishing that and putting your name against oh, it. You actually want to go back or just want to tell me that? No, I want to, I want to ask a question on the model oh, okay. because I think. Um, I like that. There, yeah. yeah. So, once again, if I may, just talk about the, the temperature control challenge for yeah. easy. Ingredients are there to find the right answer. It's yeah. maybe the match how you light the fuel with different thinking. Right. I think part of the issue in New Zealand though is like the Ford dealer has always seen the opposition as the Ford dealer. Does that make sense? Like he's never seen Toyota or Honda, it's been Ford against Ford. Or, whereas um, instead of thinking about New Zealand as New Zealand, we tend to think about exactly the same products that each company does. Whereas if you can actually collaborate that together and start thinking like this, and start to play in a different field. It almost does go back to that chicken versus you know, butter example. We, we, we struggled to go on to what? Can't do that. That was our early foray into into the um, into that um, that chill this model of the chill um, thing. We just couldn't get it across the line. So does it have to be limited to chilled food? Sorry, say again. No. Does it have to be limited to chilled food? Couldn't it be a cross industry collaboration? Oh well, yeah. And, and from a chilled perspective, you mean? Yeah. I think so. I think I know. So your question is... So does, does it just have to align to chilled product only? Can it be across the spectrum? Don't know. I think, I think, I think that when you, as soon as you're dealing with food, you, there, are, there are certain requirements that really do restrict what you can do. Um, I think that's what I'm saying to that. That might be just a question of design of the vehicle that you're yep. using or design of the... Once again. What exactly? Like 7-Eleven so, yeah. did. And you, and you go back to, the, to this model in a way, um, what, actually what's not on here, uh, and, and, and is uh, depending on what the problem is, you know, there, there, there is somewhere, somewhere in here there's investment. And these partners all need to invest in different ways, like to go and invest in a new sort of kit to suddenly share, uh, be able to share assets. You only really want to do it if you know that you've got all the cargo owners on board that are going to then commit to that. You know, you, you, there are you know often often truckies go and create new new types of kit because they, there's a market for them. But when you're starting to do bespoke type arrangements, and you'll see the, the example I'm going to take you through, when you're starting to invest in bespoke type assets to solve a problem like this, and they're quite unique. You kind of want to know you've got 10 years out of it, so you see, sort of need to know that first. So you needed to have really got, you know, these people all lined up before you work out how you're going to solve the problem in a way. Because you've all got a, you all know, you're all involved in the problem, you've got aligned strategies and you, you're all kind of um, you know, bought into it. You then set about trying to solve it. As opposed to, I guess, the old way, which is I'll build a truck, I'll build it like this and I'll see who I can get. You know what? And then, um, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to the next RFP and see if I win. And I might get this, might get a two-year contract, I might get a one-year contract, I might get no contract. And, you know, so it's, it's that challenge of of investing based, and particularly once again, this is a big problem. This, this is this is significant investment to change the network. That other model I just talked about is people operating the same network, but trying to get the uh, you know get a little bit of competitiveness, which goes back to that. Um, wherever I had that other thing there. Uh, sorry, that, there you know. Just trying to compete. Um, and it works, but it's still inefficient when you sit back and you have a look at the network. Scott, in terms of the uh, large supply chain players in New Zealand, how much more room do you think there is for collaboration? Like how many are involved in this network that we're talking about? Oh, I think there's huge scope. Um, we're we're just touching the surface. We're quite we're quite over oh, there. We're getting into Ontario, but we're very uh, specific around um, 
food graders and great companies doing similar sorts of things with, with a whole lot of more general type freight. Um, and a company like Main Freight does it very well inherently within their own network. They don't need to really work with anyone else. They're very, very good at filling a truck up with boxes and they probably fill it up both ways. And it just, so, you know, this is, once again, this is, this is not, just not unique to us. Um, but at the same time, there's a huge amount of waste still in our network. Uh, you know, then you, then, you know, we're also very focused on rail, and I'll show you the example next. You know, there's inherently more investment and thinking required to try and crack the rail uh, conundrum, if you like. So, um, and, and this is scalable, you know, that model's scalable. It can just be some people within their own network. You know, the guys doing wine, um, whatever the connected thing is in Napier uh, and Nelson through to uh, Wineworks. Uh, well, Wineworks, but then they've got Wine Connect or Port Connect. They've done a great job. Two trucks. I think it's two, maybe three, I'm not sure. Bottles on my wine yard. Pretty simple, but you know, pretty obvious. But they weren't doing it before someone sat there and thought, oh, we can do that, but we didn't need the flash model to work that out either. Just took some some different thinking, and and, 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 the, and the other thing about this is there is always some losers. As soon as you make, as soon as you take waste out of the trucking network, and you have product in two trucks and empty legs the other way, and you put them in one truck, there's one truck driver that hasn't got a load. So there is a natural selection that goes on. You know, it's not all beer and pizza. Um, at Kumbaya around the fire, you know, you, you've invited some people in, some people get missed out. Because for waste to be taken out of the network, it means that there'll be, um, and often it's the noise you hear after the fact is that people would have missed out because they've, they've suddenly got more waste. They're empty. So, you, you know, and, and it takes a while for those assets to be removed from the system. Eventually, they'll, they won't be there anymore. And eventually, only the, the top uh, people will, will work through. Comes back to who you choose. You know, people have to, they have to be the quality players. They need to be sustainable. They, you know, they need to be viable, etc. Uh, you know, so there's all these things you need to think about. You know, so it's a, it's a, um, it's not a, you know, it has, it has some tough, some tough moments. Well, what I, what I, um, what I thought I'd do, then this is something we use, uh, this is really just an example of, of, of what we've done. Um, and from a, a contextual perspective, this is the North Island. Um, Auckland, where you've got importers and you've got distributors. This is a port, it's actually a port of Tauranga, but it could well be port to Auckland. Um, this is the lower North Island, where you've got, and I guess the dynamics of New Zealand as a country is that, you know, a lot, most of our, uh, most of our importers and distributors do, are actually in Auckland. Um, most of the stuff is consumed in Auckland. Um, a lot of our large exporters are down country. And in particular, this is Whairawa that we, or, or um, in this case, that we talked about before. And um, in the case of imports and domestic product, probably if you think about you know, a sort of very general supply chain, stuff that's made in Auckland, 50% of it gets consumed in Auckland, 25% gets sent to the lower North Island, and 25% goes to South Island, roughly, give or take. So this is, the, this is the model of the North Island. And of course, the problem I talked before about, and I'll start with the import supply chain, and the import supply chain is not too bad. Import containers come into the port, they get railed or roaded through to the importer where they get de-banned, the stuff gets put on a shelf. Uh, and the empty container goes into a storage uh, facility. Interestingly enough, um, I think, I don't know how many, I don't know what percentage of, um, I, think, I think New Zealand's biggest import still, you know what biggest, New Zealand's biggest import is? Empty yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We bring in more empty containers than what we do. Well, now might be some theorist might tell me it's like wrong. That's a good story, but it's about right. I think, I'm pretty sure it's wrong. Um, it was really yeah. So that's why that's there. That's that right. That's empty containers once again going into the container stack. So we've got empty, we've got a, uh, that import container is now a container sitting empty container sitting on the stack because it's had stuff taken out of it. <coughs> then you look at the export supply chain and they we send the, uh, the empty container down to the um, manufacturer, the exporter, and we put them on rail to get to the port. 
two things about this which are interesting. One is that that was obviously empty, still a container, um, and that is only partially utilised because once again the ship comes in and it's all about the order and the order is fixed and it's put on a train and it's order by order. It's a bit like uh, you know the warehouse is, is being very efficient and it's loading the orders and it realises when the train comes in and it's, it's quite an efficient um, supply chain. Um, and actually, Kiwi I think is quite good because they're getting paid the whole, you know, both ways. The fact that nothing's in there. And actually, Fonterra's quite happy because they need the container, so they need the container. But we look at it and go, well, there's a whole lot of space. Then you've got your, oh, so your actual train is 70% underutilised, even though it's got a container both ways. There's 70% of the time, there's, there's sort of air in that, in that train. Because this rail here is not, often not fully used because you've only packed enough to go into the order to go onto the boat and you haven't thought about maximising that train. Then you've got your... Um, what have you got now? Yeah, then you've got your domestic supply chain where you've got your importers send stuff to distributors who send 25% of it down to the low and North Island and ordinarily that truck might go back empty. Not always, but you know, we end up with trucks being about 40% empty or empty 40% of the time. So once again, you look you look at that supply chain, and in each each individual supply chain, you probably worked quite hard to get it quite efficient. But you sit back and have a look at a lot of dotted lines, and so you go, and then you then you overlay the strategic issue that that we had, which was to fill a big ship and to get product close to port to be able to fill a big ship. And you go, okay, so what what, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to rethink this network? And at that point, it's all about bringing the supply chains together to take waste out of the network. And we start, this time we'll start with the export supply chain, and rather than take those um, shipping containers that are sitting here down to the product, we thought, well, let's take the export product to a consolidation point. And a couple of, a couple of useful things about this. We've filled that train, that particular train there, whereas you have the dotted lines going over here. We've filled that train because we've actually, where a 40 foot container was on a 50 foot wagon in the original model, so you had 10 feet with nothing, and it literally had yeah, a container that was 40 foot, and then you had here. We've now got two of these 25 foot curtain sided units. So we've added 30% capacity going northbound. So 30% more product is now on that rail network. So that's a huge win. Um, and we've consolidated our freight close to the port, ready for that big ship. Now we've had to change the whole model within Fonterra because they're no, they're no longer picking on orders, they're now picking just to replenish the order that's going to be placed up here, so the whole other thing that they had to work through. And this is now a dairy grade facility because we're unpacking that container and we're sitting that product in the cross dock. There's a cost involved in that. Uh, at that point, we put, bring the container across to this point here, stack it, uh, pack it into an export box and, and rail it straight to port. What's interesting about this rail line is we're, we're filling that train as well because we're um, because it's shorter, closer, we can get multiple orders on the train. And, and by the way, that's actually got more capacity on that rail line than that rail line. And so in the old model, we were driven by the capacity of that one, so that that went around there, so that you couldn't, that line slightly thicker. That was not only underutilised, but you couldn't put as much on it even if it was fully utilised. So you've got that one fully utilised, and you're pumping more product out to now what is the bigger ship. So improved flow to slow to port. So you've solved that initial strategic problem you had about getting freight close to the big ship port, and then being able to move freight a lot quicker to that port, and you're taking waste out of that out of that, um, you've, you know, you've lowered the cost of the, of, um, of the export supply chain, but you're double handling and you've had to invest in a pretty smart bit of kit around uh, intermodal units and you've had to build a big new facility because one didn't exist, it was dairy grade and rail surf. So how do you pay for that? If you actually look at the import supply chain, probably not much changed, still product come in, it might even come in Auckland versus Carolman, but it just still goes to the importer. Um, but empty containers can possibly come straight 
to this facility where, where it can be sent across to the export container, or import products can come to this facility as well. So suddenly you've got import product, you've got export product all within the same facility, so you're utilising that facility a little bit more and you're getting a bit more revenue and return out of it. Once again, complementary product and how you manage that segregation, etc. And the next bit is where the gold dust is, because at that point you're taking the domestic product. Remember these guys, they're not rail surf. So they don't they don't they don't have access to rail, it's not something they're used to doing because in fact rail is all about export containers predominantly, but you need to have um, now they're used to trucks. And the other thing, rail was inherently uh, uh, unreliable to be fair. And a truck's not a bad thing. It turns up, it's got rubber wheels, and you move wherever it needs to move to. And you know that when it leaves, it's kind of going to go straight and you might stop for a pie on the way, but it's going to get to where it needs to in, in probably pretty quick time. And if there's a, a blockage in the motorway, well, it might be able to go around it. Rail, bridges out, you know, unreliable, you know, and historically it always was. So we've had to really work with rail to convince the distributors that actually we can, we can road your product to this facility, or we can take one of these units to your site. You can load it up, bring it to us here, we'll, take, we'll do the hard bit, we'll put it on the train and take it down to our hub down there. You've now got both ways, rail, 100% full. On road again, across to the distributor, they, un they undo, the, they, they take the stuff out. And then there's only one um, leg that's actually got nothing in it. And in the of the case of Fire Row, this is a leg between Palmerston North and um, Fire Row almost just down the road. Better utilisation of rail, less trucks on the road. So, quite, quite complicated though. And someone's got to manage it. Uh, people have to change, you, know, you come back to Fonterra, they have to fundamentally change how they load export boxes. They used to load in on. That's a container, now they're loading side on. In fact, they're now taking, that's quicker. So they had to modify their whole operation to make that happen, but they got savings. They got savings through quicker loading of containers, they got savings because they could uh, lower costs because you're actually putting more on a wagon, still paying the same wagon rate. Um, from a coder perspective, we can fund that because we're now selling that space going south. People that are in that, the, the FMCGs that are in that are now on rail and paying less what they were on road and we've managed to work with key rail to make sure the reliability is where it needs to be. Different than what it used to be on a truck, but then that's reliable. So if you think about overall strategic benefits, you know, we're, we're, taking, we're taking the big ship strategy because we're close to the port in terms of that consolidation point. We're creating, we're sending stuff further, uh, which goes back to the very left-hand side of that, of that continuum of, of, the, of the collaboration continuum. But we're creating more efficiency because we're using road and rail better. We're increasing the utilisation of the return trip to actually 100%. We're full both ways. From where I had it earlier, which was 30%, we actually full that, that train, that particular train between um, um, Fire Ra, Auckland, and then Auckland and Tower. Um, it's full both ways. And we've increased rail capacity by 30%, which is what I mentioned in terms of that 50 foot wagon in a 40 foot container versus two 25 foot on that 50 foot container. And we've lowered southbound cost and we've created new revenue for that. We've taken trucks off the road and we've saved fuel, uh, reduced carbon emissions and equivalent of planting some trees. So it's a great story. Hit the strategy benefits, hit the economic benefits, social and environmental tax tax. But it's been hard. Had to create assets, cross stop intermodal units, but the thing about these intermodal units, they'll be slow. Which is why if you're going to invest in these you need to have long-term contracts because in fact they fit through two tunnels between Palmerston North and Whararoa. The other units, the other intermodal units in the New Zealand Rail Network don't. They might eventually if they start being pulled through quickly, but right now they don't. And so we've had, we had to design these and the lights you actually notice are slightly in. Uh, we had to design them because we've got normally a, an export container doesn't have pellets in it, so it can be a bit lower, that's why it can get through the tunnel. But we've had to design the, the height of opening height so that we could look at the product coming out of Fire Rail, and I think 80 85% of it in terms of density can fit in these with pellets. At that point, we had to work out how 
you know, how much structural rigidity you had down the bottom unit in terms of the height of the actual unit. You know, we had to get through tunnels, then we had to have a high door height. So it's a lot of design went in these. They had to be food grade in terms of sealable. All the other intermodal units in the New Zealand network weren't able to be sealed in terms of and to meet the food grade requirements, security requirements. They actually needed dunnage bags, which you can't kind of see there, they just put in here, so that you know the load stability was there, so we had to specially design dunnage, you know, blow up bags and things like that. Like you know, you pump it up and you live it out again. So kind of makes sense, but you've got to think through all, the, all these things through. Um, which is sort of the, the, the quality compliance, the dairy compliance, and the business system, you know, getting even getting the order now placed on Savile Drive, which is where our North Auckland facility is, versus the order being placed on Fire Row, is huge, you know. Frontier had to change their way of thinking. The FMCG had to change their business systems. We had to get Kiberell working far, far more better than what they were. So they had to see value in this, go back to the collaboration model. They had to see some value in this. And they were, they're filling their trains up. Uh, but we had to turn that into dollars and make sure that they, you know, they were um, uh, happy with that. Um, and you know, culturally, they had to make some big mindset shifts to think about uh, to be part of this. It kind of makes sense, but you know, it's a big organisation. You know, getting them on board was, was tricky. Same with hauliers. Hauliers were losing out of this. We were taking trucks off the road, so how do we keep them engaged because we still need them? Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the exporters and the FMCGs had to think about how the, ne their network ran differently because actually not all the FMCG product could go on this. Um, so we had to go, well actually, you know, think about your product in terms of base first flex. You know, what's your base product that you can pump up every single day? Put down, you know, put it in here. The other stuff, send it on a truck. So you, they had to start thinking about what they and I know many of them do anyway, but you know, just making sure that um, uh, you know, they think about their, their uh, lead times, etc. and their replenishment versus, you know, critical, etc. And then when you think about, go back to my model around, and I'll give you an example of Countdown. We bring Countdown and the Savile Drive as an import box, rather than that box going to their site where they work out where it's going to go. They leave it on our site, they then ring us in the evening and they tell us the boxes we demand, we know exactly what product is going to go into that TSF unit. We know what product is going to go to their warehouse for replenishment in autumn, or which product is going to go straight into a container, a different container to be coastal down to coastal. So once again, we take that away from them because we've got this central unit where all the export containers are, and the exports are leaving, imports are um, you know, arriving. So we, we start to do that type of um, uh, multimodal, you know, different way of thinking about the supply chain that uh, you know that the FMCGs are had to really be in their mind and change their mindset to, to, to adapt or adopt. Um, so I'm going to move, move away from the physical model and I want to actually go to the, um, so this is segue again, so that for break point. Any questions on that? No? So I remember, um, you know, when we, moving to that very right hand side collaboration piece, because the other, I might go back to a question before. Actually, the other thing that we, you know, we sat there about two years ago and we thought, well, all this great network, and we're talking about our truck network now. 100 trucks, 1,000 lane miles, et cetera, you know, 600 to 900 trucks on the road a day. And every day at about 3 o'clock, we were still on the phone looking for a truck. And every day we still had some freight that we couldn't find a truck for. So how's that work? So that truck doesn't take that freight, there's some structural challenges, or the truck's not on pace, or the freight's not quite right, etc. And everyone else was doing the same thing. Well, every other company was three o'clock, everyone's looking for trucks, everyone's looking for freight. Whereas there's a ton of trucks and a ton of freight. They're just not connecting. So the, the, the standard way of connecting just was on the phone and it didn't quite work. So we, we, you know, we just did the old classic. Imagine if we had Uber for trucks. Because in an Uber, the person that knows where the taxi is is the taxi driver. The person that knows where they want to be picked up from is the person that's standing on the side of the road waiting to be picked up. All you need to do is the two match very seamlessly. So we uh, we did a bit of research this time, uh, rather than once again trying to do it ourselves, because we I think we thought about doing it ourselves, but this was just a little bit out of our league, and we found a couple of guys or three guys in, in, in Switzerland. 
uh, two Americans and a, and a German that were doing something very similar, and this was it. Uh, so we realised that it's what we were looking for. We also realised that these were pretty smart guys, and we, you know, we could do well by having them help us out. They were looking for somewhere to incubate and, and develop this model in a bit more detail. They were looking for an investor. So we ended up buying 30% of little organisations. So we went from, a, uh, I guess, a physical asset type organisation, all there with that four old freight orchestrator role to being a, a tech investor, sort of. But we were able to help them develop it and start to work on how it would work in New Zealand and um, subsequently uh, actually gone back to Europe to, to start to sell it up there. And it works, you know. Um, and this is, and, you know, and there's two things. A, it's smart logic that can mean that you can connect and go back to the collaboration uh, mantra. You can connect lots of people, lots of freight, <coughs> with lots of trucks seamlessly. Now, there are obviously constraints and there's things you need to fill in and there, there are, you know, there, there are, there are closed pools you may, may work in versus the open market. Um, but, you know, from a technology perspective, it's all there. And you've got these sort of interfaces that people actually quite like using. Um, one of the biggest challenges we've got is that most cargo owners don't want this because they know which truck's coming to pick up their stuff and they like that person. So they don't want, you know, they like Blue Star Taxi, they don't want an Uber. So once again, it's a mindset. Because how do you take people on the journey that actually, this, this is still a useful tool. And in the States, for example, there's a very big open mark, uh, spot market for, for trucks. New Zealand isn't. New Zealand's very relationship based. So it comes back to the collaboration question. Of, you know, most people actually in New Zealand will only collaborate with the people that they've already invited to the barbecue, you know, which is which is fine. I've made the analogy slightly falling over there, but you know, they don't spread their minds to go, who can I actually, you know, who's out there doing some stuff? Who can I work with that maybe I don't know? And you know, tools like this enable that, but there's still this cultural mindset within New Zealand that makes that difficult. And the States, I think, are over it just because of the sheer scale that you're dealing with. So New Zealand creates challenges around collaboration. As soon as you've got mates working with mates, well, you know what, you're just going to work with your mate. You could well be, and I'm probably party to this, missing out on something. At least we had scale that we were working with so many people, we kind of could pick and choose a wee bit. So it sort of goes back to that comment about you know, who, you, who you choose and you know, are you thinking more broadly through my model that I put up earlier. But this is fascinating, yeah, this is still a learning curve for us. But it takes that uh, level of collaboration to a whole new um, um, space, I guess. Uh, and I think, um, really, this is only, only two more slides, but you know, we, this is actually our, uh, our internal um, we call it, um, strategy on page, I suppose. Uh, you know, we are about keeping New Zealand competitive global access. It's about creating domestic efficiencies and thinking collaboratively with freight owners to try and you know, keep New Zealand competitive on the global stage. So that's why we're here, that's why we're set up, that's our purpose. Our strategy is, is to optimise the network. It's about intermodal capability, 4PL, which includes the technology piece, and, and 3PL um, solutions that need to be quality and trusted, etc. And none of that's unique either. Plenty of people are technically doing that. Not many people are doing all of these in one go. But it's the bit below the line that really differentiates us a little bit. You know, we have the scale, which is what I talked about in that model. That, that helps. We've got the partnerships, once again, through that network that we've created. And as a result, you know, we're able to take the network view, be innovative, and create the network that we need to create. So that's that approach where you're harnessing the power of many to keep us all one step ahead. So yes, we've got a closed pool of many that we're, talking, we're working with, with you know, the ones we've selected, but you know, you, you, that, that creates the power to be able to do this. But actually, the bit that I, um, this is the cultural piece actually, the bit that I think really makes the difference is, the, is what you know, loosely we call the mission, which is where we are trying to think long term and, and try to make life better. Um, we do, once again, take that orchestrator role, you know, we want to be the lead, we, we're in a position to be the lead and we're using that position wisely. Now we're honest and we, we share. We're not afraid to tell people what we're doing, because I guess that mantra of you're better off to work with people like 
um, you, you know, working collectively, you're going to get more done. So we're, we're quite happy to share most things that we're, we're doing and why we're doing it. And we are about reducing waste, working smarter, being efficient, and using better because you know, you're not going to try, you're not going to be able to achieve what we're trying to achieve if you are just using the scale to have a bigger stick. Just won't cut it. And it comes down to the last one. People just won't hang around because that's, there is no value in that. Or there might be short term value, but not long term value. So it's about thinking differently, being transparent, and actually sharing those benefits, which is why that last one, create value. If you can't do that, and you can't buy people into the value and share the value effectively, um, none of this will, will stick. And we call it smarter logistics together, and it's kind of, you know, it's just a nice way to pull it all together. Um, but you know what, that, you know, sort of we live by that, and uh, it works, it has its challenges, which goes back to the, to the last slide, which I thought I'd put that up again, so <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, it goes, you know, this, this is tough, because you know, you, smarter logistics together is a great theory, but any one of these start to erode, and life changes. And I, I go back to my 137 or 137, you know, that model that I talked about. Actually, we had a global economic downturn and the seven went to five before we'd even started uh, this whole thing because suddenly you know, ocean freight carriers were, were dropping their, their rates trying to stay alive. So suddenly our 137, sharing the value, the value wasn't there to share. And people didn't need to do all this great stuff to get a lower ocean freight, ocean freight rate. So you had to just sort of rethink it. So things are always changing if you think you've got a collaborative model and your value proposition is really clear and everyone's aligned on your strategy. Strategies change, value propositions change, people change, organisations change, um, therefore your partners might change. So, how do you, you know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant moving beast. Um, which, where I finish? Any, uh, any thoughts, questions? If I stole someone's mom, I still don't remember. Doug Lambert, my son. Question on your 4PL network. Yeah. How widely do you make that available beyond your partners? Are you open freight model like in the States? No, or no, we're, 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 um, uh, we're pretty limited, really. Uh, and I think that's one of our challenges over the next couple of years is how we can actually make that a little bit more open. And I think the TNX model will help. Um, but, you know, we're, in fact, it's funny, uh, I'm going to segue slightly in a way, you know, this can be a bit of a wrong for your bank as well, because, and we find it, um, you know, our model is very much around the area, it's very much around the compliance levels of the required theory, so we don't venture much beyond that, we're looking for complementary, we can't find it, we give it a miss, there's lots of value out there that we think we could capture, we're just not going out, and our competitors do it really well, and uh, I can sit there you kind of hamstrung a little bit by this wonderful collaboration tool that we've created. But it means you can tend to be, you know, you, you stick to your, you know, if you're very clear on that, very clear on that, very clear on that, you, you, you kind of, you're locked into this. So you, your level of entrepreneurialness can be, can actually be a little bit, you know, um, um, you know, hindered, I guess, that's where I'm at. So, you know, you might have multiple of these, but in our particular case around our four field, uh, it's probably hindered our growth a little bit. And that's, that's not a secret, it's just where we are you now, it's one of our next phases. So, uh, once again, 10X was an example to go, well, how we can how we play in that space to be part of something that. You know. Question. Oh, sorry. Um, um, Certainly my experience has been that continually changing landscape. Mm -hmm. you know, the shipping lines come and go, change their ports, the strategies change, people go, mm -hmm. change, and sort of partnerships that I have established, and it, it is a strain to keep them together. You know, you think you've got it all lined up and then within a year, two years, you can see things beginning to move. Mm -hmm. You started off with a 10 year term. If you had your time again, would you go five years or 20 years or, or what, what's your, how do you feel that dynamic plays out, given that there's real investment to be made? Well, what I was actually going to say as you were talking, Tom, is that it's really important to have the T's and C's and the legals behind it. You know, no matter how much you think your family or your family <coughs> and uh, your love can come into your barbecue, 
you know, you, you, you can't, you've got to do all that as well. And that'd be another thing on the model, which is, you know, well, you cover your ass, right? Um, so that's the first point. So I guess all of those things are vitally important. If you think you're going to do this just based on absolute trust, then I think there's a way to count. Uh, you'll get caught out. Um, yeah, I think I think ten years. I wouldn't go longer. Just quietly. So all your investment, whatever that may be, has got to be set over that period. Yeah, and, and I think the board would probably demand that regard. Yeah. And I think there's I think there's another part is that most organisations, this is a mindset thing. Most organisations couldn't commit. You go to any board and go, hey, we want to do a twenty year deal. And because no, no one, no one actually will think. No matter how long term they like to think, I'll go. You know, I get that, but no, no, do ten, ten plus ten. I'm not sure, or five plus five. But they, I don't, I don't think you need to go much longer than ten. I think ten's a good. Ten's a long time. Yeah, it is. I mean, what's interesting now, you look at, um, but you, then you look at someone like Kiwi Rail, and you look at governments, and you look at local bodies, and they're thinking 20, 30, 40, 50 years out. They need to. You know, where they're going to put rail yards, etc. So there's always this disconnect between what you're doing now and what you're investing for now versus where, um, you know, how, 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 how the networks might change. So there's lots of different dynamics you need to consider. You look at Tainu, you know, it's another one, right? They, I don't know how long they're investing out, but they've got a lot of, a lot of um, resources that, and they, they can absolutely think long term. So how do they? How do they play with people? Everyone has different risk appetites. Which is just need to you need to consider all these. Uh, nice secret. I guess you know what you've worked on is fixing a problem which wasn't solved by competition. Yeah. Or I guess there's blind spots in, in businesses where, where supply chain wasn't a major focus. So putting it into a new organisation to do that. So um, how is this going to kick on from a New Zealand perspective with a port strategy and what we're doing with you know, these big lumps of infrastructure and, and I guess the public investment behind some of these assets? Well, we know. You know, there, there's, there's another thing that sort of related in that. We're doing this, but there are competitors. You know, you know ports of Auckland, you go, same thing. Right? Napier, same thing. Uh, Littleton, exactly the same thing. And, and um, there's, there's two schools of thought. One is that we're actually duplicating assets. And you're going to go and look at Littleton and look at Rolleston. We've got a, it's a long story, but we've got a nice big tennis court there, ready to take some containers. And there's another one right next door. So you go, that's a bit strange. Um, the reverse, you know, Mike's just left, you know, a very similar sort of model in terms of Nexus, in terms of what they're doing in Port Talking. But, which, which all works, and but there's the second school. So the first school I thought was actually, why don't we all play together? And then it gets a bit hard as well. You know. uh, aligned school of thought is surely the ports can be a little bit more strategic because what does my head in the most in all of this is that it's port on port, and we're still seeing ports compete against port, and we're just a pawn in the ports game. I can be a little bit bold. But where I was then going to take it is that I actually think you take a long-term view and, um, you know, we're only getting more and more freight and we are, there, there's, it's never going to, there's always going to be too much for one, one collaborative outfit anyway. So the challenge then is short-term versus long-term, um, how do you, do you work together now or do you only wait until you have to? Uh, you know, you go to Rolleston, for example. There'll be there'll both both middle and metro will, will both be outgrown within sort of probably ten years. So, at what point do you go? Let's work together. Right now, we're hugely competitive. So, so I don't quite. It's a tricky one. Um, you can only play the ball that's in front of you. You can only play within the time frame that you're prepared to and risk you're prepared to take. And you are going to be competing for the customers, for example, in the Wollaston area. Um, but at the same time, you need to be confident, as we are, with our Fonterra volume or our Western volume. Um, and we're happy with that. So it, it's, it's a real tricky one in terms of whether New Zealand, and it goes back to the New Zealand discussion, whether we should all sit back 
and kind of all throw our cards on the table, everyone come into the same room, the ports, all the trucking companies, rail, and go, right, we're going to make this thing work. Where you go, you know what, I'm going to make my little thing work and I'm going to, I, need how I know how much weight I need and I'm going to have a competitive advantage. I am going to compete against those guys. But I'm going to do it in a very collaborative way and a sustainable way, but it's going to work for me. It might not work for me. Where is the tipping point? I'm not sure. So we kind of play the ball that's in front of us. We play the certain key customers that we have. We're not, we're not as, a, as an organisation, Coda, we're not sitting there trying to capture the market and warn everybody. Going. Food grade, dairy, uh, containerized, pelletized, um, complementary to Fonterra, where it makes sense. So we'll target them in. Because actually, if we get them, this model works and we can lower the cost for them and we can lower the cost for Fonterra and we can create the model. Uh, and that should be enough compelling proposition so that you know, the other guys go, well, in some cases, we directly compete even on those. You win some, you lose some. But it becomes quite a, this it goes back to my point around the Corpio, you do become quite particular who you deal with and why you deal with them. Which freight's going in the opposite direction? Um, that's compatible. How much is it? Yeah, how much of it is there? Who do they currently use? The so business development becomes quite targeted and it becomes more a uh, talking to, oh, Martin, I think. Mean, um, so Marcus and someone about um, become quite um, uh, solution focused as opposed to just I'm going to, you know, it's cold, there's no such thing as a cold call in this model. It's very much around how, you know, who you think you can work with goes back to the model and why they, why they fit, why they're in this box. Probably the key. That then drives to who you talk with. How you them, do you like them? Can you, can you get on with them? Are they prepared to come to the table? I'm not prepared to. If you can show them that actually there's an alignment, but they might, might need to change a bit, but they're not prepared to come to the table, well, then they don't take that box. Maybe you need to take them here first, show them the money, see how interested they are. But knowing that actually they have to invest to get that money and they need to change what they're doing. So it becomes a bit of a triangle just to get, just to get them all set up. And then things change, and as you get bigger, and you know, then you know, the box, and I can quite answer your question. But New Zealand Link to me uh, is a little bit of a misnomer in a way. Um, we often talk about it, but it kind of, yeah, you know, my first comment about we compete against it, the globe and not each other, yeah, I, I, I buy into it to a degree, to a degree, because at the end of the day, you know, we've got a port, we need to make sure we get volume across, just the same as Dale has his own, you know. Um, we've got a, a large customer, they, they need to get their containers there, they just want to know that they can balance that and get a lower, lower rate. So you know what, we all have competing factors, and it's how you overcome them. From Mark, as I can see you. If you do have any more questions for Scott, we do have about 10-15 minutes of drinks. Uh, that where you can discuss and ask questions. Scott, thank you very much. It sounds like you're trying to solve many problems at once with globalisation, technology, ever changing pace of things. Yep. Uh, interesting model. I think uh, collaboration is the way to go. It's certainly a buzzword anyway, right now. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.